Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me here to comment on this very interesting paper. Uh, I'm a great admirer of Jason's and of Charles Murray's and CIS, so I'm very glad to be here. I fundamentally agree with Jason's story and in particular want to emphasize his point that the influx of less educated foreign workers, mostly Hispanic but others, has distracted us uh, politically and otherwise from declining low-skilled male workforce participation. And this has been well documented by Jason, by people like Nick Eger Eberstadt. <clears throat> and I also agree that this is not a demand problem. Now this distraction enables uh, journalists and other uh, kibitzers to say all sorts of contradictory things, and I think that's one of the downsides of it. So I do think that immigration, the immigration surge, exerts, to quote Vernon Briggs, the late Cornell labor economist, a narcotic effect on low-wage employers and the rest of us. But I want to add to his account and supplement it by uh, looking at a particular aspect of the story that I think is important. Not only does the availability of low-skilled immigrants blunt the adverse labor effects of reduced native work effort, but it also masks, I think, a painful truth about the relatively poor and deteriorating quality and work ethic of our unskilled workforce. And of course, I'm, I'm lumping here. There's obviously a range. I'm talking about the average. And this latter point leads to my partial cautious disagreement with Rich Wine on the displacement issue. I recognize it's hard to prove displacement for reasons good and bad. These categories of who's looking for work are incredibly manipulable. And looking at the National Academy study, this is glaringly obvious. But I think there is other evidence, albeit less quantitative, that suggests a kind of displacement. So what am I referring to here? Well, there are a handful of mainly ethnographic studies of employer attitudes towards entry-level workers from different ethnic and racial groups, including recent immigrants versus native workers of various kinds. These studies were almost all conducted in the 1990s. There's one I've identified from 2011. And they begin with the fairly well-known piece by two social scientists, Jolene Kirschenman, Catherine Neckerman, published by Christopher Jenks in his volume, The Urban Underclass, entitled, We'd Really Love to Hire Them, But, uh, and also includes some data from William Julius Wilson on Chicago employers, published uh, in When Work Disappears. And they consist largely of lengthy interviews of mid-level or small businessmen and managers from different locations and industries. And lucky for us, these studies have recently been collected by David Strentney, an able political scientist, in chapter six of his book, After Civil Rights. And I commend this chapter to you. But just to summarize, right, what are the results of these studies? For many jobs, especially low hard skill jobs, right, employers strongly and candidly prefer recent immigrant workers, Hispanic and Asian mainly, right, and, or and others. They are not keen on white American workers, those are sort of lesser beings, and they're positively avoid black unskilled workers, especially those from the inner city or the ghetto. And they're pretty unvarnished about it. Now, why these preferences? Employers from all groups hold these preferences, minority, immigrant, doesn't matter, right? Well, they stereotype like crazy. They lump, they try to individuate, but of course, time is short, knowledge is short, so they can't always do that. In Scrantney's account, less educated immigrant, Hispanic, and Asian workers are seen as having better work ethic and far superior soft skills, which is what counts in this population because the hard skills are minimal. They're more tractable, diligent, punctual, agreeable, hardworking, reliable, less demanding, surly, oppositional, et cetera, willing to, quote, work through pain and injury to do boring and repetitive tasks. They are helpful and loyal. They step up. Uh, and they volunteer to perform beyond the call of duty. This is all uh, in the chapter. Now, Scrantney sort of avoids opining on whether these preferences are justified. He's very concerned about the lack of PC here. Uh, but it is clear from the studies and his exposition that these attitudes do influence hiring by employers who grow to great lengths to find the workers they favor and avoid the workers they disfavor. 
And I think the implications of these studies is something like a displacement story, of, although, of course, not quantitative and systematic, right? The more immigrant workers there are to fill the construction and service and farm and restaurant jobs, the fewer native workers are going to get those jobs, even if they want them, and that's a big if, and more on that in a moment. And maybe there will be a kind of discouragement effect. And here is the displacement angle. Maybe the native workers or the black workers know they're not going to get the job, so forget it, right? Just don't even go there. Now, this literature has shortcomings. It's anecdotal. It's not up to date. Most of it's from the 90s. Academics, interestingly, seem to have dropped this line of inquiry, although ethnography is all the rage. They've stopped interviewing employers, maybe because they don't like what they're hearing. Right? And it's mainly focused on race and black unemployment, although there are comments interlarded there about the white sort of low-skilled uh, trailer park types, right? So it would be interesting to see more studies. And of course, it only supports a partial displacement story. It's about the demand side, but there's also the supply side. Would workers step up and take these jobs? We have this mantra, this mindless mantra, jobs Americans won't do, and I'll say more about that, right? But I want to even add to this account, I think not only is there a problem in workforce shortcomings, but I think there is evidence of a deterioration in the past 15 or 20 years in the quality of the native workforce. Once again, not systemic, not complete, right? Little bits and pieces here and there. First, as reported by David Autor, an economist at MIT, a prolific economist, and others, there is now growing evidence that changing family structure, the rise in single parent families, which are almost the predominant form of family in the lower 50% of society, has harmed lower income boys disproportionately, undermining their socialization to education, work, family life, and constructive social roles. And I think that has to play out in work readiness. Apart from that, there are other observations that I think also point to a declining worker quality. And once again, this is quite anecdotal, but if you read the newspapers, it's amazing, it's amazing what you'll pick up uh, if you pay attention. So item, recently a report that Quest, a company that performs medical and drug tests for businesses, has seen a dramatic spike in positive drug tests for job applicants, right? And especially among whites, especially among native workers, right? And of course, this is supported by stories of rising problems with drug use and addiction. There's also a steady drumbeat of reports in the media of employers complaining of a shortage of good workers, you know, one side of this Obama angle, right? The difficulty of finding reliable, hardworking people to fill jobs like truck drivers, factory workers, food and service workers, and the like, with all the complaints about absenteeism, tardiness, uh, you know, surliness. Uh, one wonderful story in the Philly Enquirer just in the past few weeks, a manager of a huge food services firm says, I can't find workers. They think the work is, quote, too cold and too wet. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there's conduct problems. That is law breaking, and that's a big problem in the black population. And physical fitness also plays a role. And this ties into the rising disability roles, right? Obesity, poor health, lack of exercise, and all of that. At a conference, an industrial organizational expert told me that one third of high school graduates cannot even qualify to enter the military, right? Because not only can they not pass the FQT, but they have criminal records, drug problems, obesity, poor health, they can't pass the physical fitness test, right? And then finally, there is this fact which all of us see with our own eyes and confronts us every day, that certain jobs seem to be done almost exclusively by immigrants when we know that native workers are standing by not too far away idle. So on a recent trip to Santa Monica, I saw only Hispanic construction workers, knowing that in south central LA, there were uh, able-bodied black men standing around uh, on street corners. And I recently saw a program on TV about the old Wisconsin Dells amusement park still in operation, all the service workers Eastern Europeans. 
under H-1B visas. These are basic jobs. They do not require an education. And I know that Milwaukee is much closer than Moldavia to Wisconsin. I know that. Now, these observations and the employer interview literature itself, which as I said, is sort of viewed now as a kind of academic hotcake, pushes hard against the standard progressive narrative. And I think the standard progressive narrative really is, looms large here, is a sort of major factor in this whole debate, right? The native joblessness problem has nothing to do with the quality or readiness of workers. It's due to broader forces, changing labor markets, disappearance of good jobs, globalization, corporate greed, these structural factors, right? And Jason detailed some of that. Immigrants aren't to blame. They take jobs Americans don't want, not further examined. Workers aren't to blame. They want to step up. They have a great work ethic. The government isn't to blame. The safety net doesn't exist. Incentivize work. Family breakdown and man's declining responsibilities are irrelevant. And finally, and I think this is incredibly important, cultural change in the attitudes towards work can't be blamed. So there's this top-down drumbeat from the media and academia, right, about the need to provide good jobs. Workers justified aversion to dead-end jobs, the whole phrase dead-end jobs pushing against the notion that it is dishonorable or heaven forfend unmanly to be idle, right? The imperative to take whatever job is available because to quote Richard Weaver, the social theorist from the last century, society somehow owes you a living, right? So you don't have to take any job that's available. And this more broad campaign against any distinction between the deserving and the undeserving poor. And if you think there is no campaign against that distinction, try working in academia, as I do, right? <laughs> so, Jason, I thank you for your paper. Uh, it's very important, but I would add the further points that employers prefer immigrants, the quality of the native workforce leaves much to be desired, and of course, ideologies and self-interest, you know, from the business class who wants cheap labor, to the left-wing elites who want pro-big government minorities and conspire us, uh, conspire to maintain this narrative, right, about the structural source of the problems of our native workforce. All of this conspires to keep us from having to confront uh, these realities. And I think it also bears on whether the shock therapy solution, if we could wave our magic wand and close the spigot of immigrant low-skilled workers, whether uh, that shock therapy solution uh, would work. Uh, given the zeitgeist, I'm not optimistic. Um, but I know that, that it's very important that we think about these issues. So I thank you.